Okay. Are we on? We are. Oh, great. I'm so happy to have that on. Oh, no, it wasn't on, yes. It won't be now. Yeah, okay. I can't remember. Um, so, Kathleen, you are going yes, to introduce H804 to us today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I get to sit in the hot seat. Wow. And uh, I promise we don't fight. Yeah, and because I've never introduced a bill before, I have prepared a written introduction and I'm going to read it. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Huh? Hope you guys don't mind. That way I won't leave out important points or. Um, so hopefully it's not too long. So, for the record, uh, my name is Representative Kathleen James, a member of the House Education Committee, and I am here today to introduce H. 804, a community schools bill. So um, I'm going to start uh, my testimony today with where I started on the issue of community schools, um, which is right at the very beginning. So um, to answer a question that Casey had asked me last week, yes. um, all schools are located in the community. So what is a community school? At its simplest, it is a public school that actively partners with families and with community organizations health and social service agencies, nonprofits, businesses, even universities, to offer well-rounded and wide-ranging opportunities, resources, and supports that help students succeed. And since these strategies are intentionally and specifically designed to reflect each school's particular needs and the community assets it can harness, no two community schools look alike. As I've learned, community schools are a clearly defined model, or really more of a strategy, that includes four pillars. One, integrated student supports. Two, expanded and enriched learning opportunities. Three, significant family and community engagement. And four, a collaborative leadership team. By integrated student supports, we mean things like access to medical care, dental care, mental health, and even resources for families, like job training or assistance with housing or nutrition. By expanded and enriched learning, we mean opportunities beyond the classroom, like after-school programs, summer programs, or even partnerships with businesses to provide internships, volunteer opportunities, or job shadowing. By family and community engagement, we're talking about things that bring families and community members into the school, programs that engage parents in the school and in their student success, courses or social events for families or community members, and opportunities for shared leadership. The school starts to feel like a neighborhood hub, and these stronger homeschool connections in turn are shown to improve student outcomes. And finally, community schools have a collaborative approach to leadership that extends beyond the administration to include families, community members, and relevant local organizations. So it's important to understand, as I have done by, you know, by doing my reading, that a community school has to integrate and include all four of these pillars. Otherwise, you're you know, picking and choosing, but you're not officially a community school. So um, as a newcomer to the legislature and to the House Education Committee, I first heard about community schools last summer at a conference um, in Denver, the National Forum on Education Policy. There was an afternoon seminar in community schools. I thought it sounded really interesting, and so I went. And at this seminar, I learned about schools in New York, Philadelphia, Miami, big cities um, that were accomplishing some really powerful things, um, transformational approaches, I thought. Um, at the, <clears throat> so I, um, I wasn't sure that this was relevant to Vermont, because we were talking about really cool programs in, you know, sort of uh, very disadvantaged neighborhoods in Baltimore, you know, or Philadelphia. Um, so I came home and I reached out to Chair Webb, and it turned out that Kate had already commissioned um, a, posi or a research paper from the Education Commission on the States about whether this model was being used in rural communities. <laughs> And I was happy and very surprised to learn that Molly Stark Elementary School in Bennington, just south of my district, has been using many of these strategies for years. Um, so on the day that Kate and I visited, um, a truck from the Vermont Food Bank was parked outside, and families were coming to fill bags filled with fresh produce. And they were receiving uh, recipe booklets that showed him how to cook these nutritious foods at home. Inside the school, a room had been set aside for a dental chair, 
where local practitioners volunteer to provide basic preventative checkups for low-income students. Molly Stark also offers summer enrichment camps in um, academic topics like math, reading, and writing for kids in all grades. You can come in the summer to Molly Stark School and take a math camp. Um, and uh, they also house child care and pre-K in the same building, which is really convenient for families. So the big question is why am I so interested in this model? We hear all the time in this committee uh, that children are arriving at our schools with a wide range of complex needs stemming from poverty, hunger, housing insecurity, and substance use disorder. This severely impacts their ability to learn, which fundamentally, is, this is an equity issue. The community school strategy is not some touchy-feely idea. And that's a, a bar that things need to clear for me. <laughs> it is a proven, data-driven approach that can help boost student attendance, academic achievement, and graduation rates. It can help close the economic, racial, and uh, or economic and racial achievement gap. And it can unlock additional funding through the federal ESSA Act because it meets ESSA's standard of evidence-based approaches for eligible schools. Um, there is a stat I saw that for every dollar you invest in um, community schools, you save $15 in other services. I have not had a chance to check out that stat yet. So I realize I just put it on the record, but I need to figure out where that data is coming from um, and take a look at it myself. Um, but I do believe that this is the kind of thing where you, have, if you invest early, you wind up saving, um, saving later. So the bill we're introducing today is model legislation um, based on Minnesota, New York, and Tennessee. I, for one, am very excited to hear the testimony, to learn more about this idea because I am not the expert, and to hear how we can possibly adapt it and offer it as a pilot program for 15 schools, districts, or SUs right here in Vermont. Thank you for having me. Mm, yeah. yeah. Very nice. All right. <laughs> Well, Colin is going to provide an additional supplementary testory, testimony as well. Uh, first of all, what thing, three things. One, thank you. That was really, um, really well done. I um, hope I did okay. You did. Well, Two, uh, can you give a copy of that to um, Avery so that we can post it? Yes, ma'am. And three, um, the governor had a proposal for a work group related to um, after school. He did. Do you see anything that you're doing that might, from this bill, that might be able to be wrapped into the concept that the governor is talking about? Uh, yeah, or, you know, or maybe even, well, the governor is talking about a universal program. So I'm not sure how these two pieces fit together. But um, community schools, um, as I mentioned, one of the four pillars is this idea that um, education doesn't end when the school day ends and that many students would benefit from after school programs, weekend programs, summer programs. Um, the, uh, the pilot program that we're suggesting would allow 15, probably at the SU level or district level here in Vermont, you know, so that we get more students, um, 15 schools to apply for a grant. And the winning schools or districts, um, the first probably year of this grant is spent doing a community um, needs and assets assessment. And so it would be up to each grantee school to look at what, pro what programs and pillars would best meet the needs of their students. So some schools may come back and say, after school is going to be a really important part of our grant. Other schools maybe would not find that to be the best you know, the, the service that their kids need the most. So I, I guess that's me saying I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking we've got Jim in the room. Was the plan to have Jim present the bill? And Colin has testimony Colin? as well from the Vermont NDA. How long do you think it'll take to present the bill? Oh, depends on questions, I guess. Maybe 15 minutes? 15 minutes. 10, 15? OK, Colin, should we get you first, then? It's your call. I think it might be helpful to get the tenants of the bill presented to us, and then we can, we can see what amount of time we have, and I know we can get you back. 
How long will I have a chance to write? This is, yeah, she this definitely will have a chance. This is fantastic. Yeah. I've seen it. I hope that's not cheating. Okay. It's on the website. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. It's on the website. <laughs> Given our time, I'm going to pass everybody to sort of hold some of your, your big questions that you have for them. That's just as a clarifying sure. question. You have a chance to talk about this again. Um, just because I think we'd like to be able to hear from you. What is your time? We well, said 15. Can you do it in 10? Okay. <laughs> we have one last question. Um, sure. So, for the record, uh, Jim Damer, Les Conso, uh, walking through H804. Um, this bill um, is actually hard to walk through because it's got lots of long paragraphs and lots of long lists. I think this, this bill came about, uh, I think, from uh, last year you introduced it. I think it came from a model. And there are lots of things in this bill that could be in rules, I think, but it's in the bill. I'm going to skip those things because that's detail that I think we don't need to focus on right now. I do want to focus on a few things, though. So um, um, there are findings here. Um, uh, let me read through the findings, and they're, they're important here. So um, findings are every child should be able to grow up and have the opportunity to achieve his or her dreams and contribute to the well-being of society. Every neighborhood deserves a public school that fully delivers on that promise. According to most uh, recent data, um, more than half of the nation's school children live in low-income households. Um, uh, okay. As a result, some school children face more challenges than others in succeeding in school and, and, and in life. Uh, community schools offer uh, facilitate the provision of comprehensive programs and services. They're carefully selected to meet the unique needs of students and families, such as addiction, prevention, treatment, and recovery, lack of stable housing, inadequate medical and dental care, hunger, trauma, and exposure to violence so students can do their best. Um, and according to a report from the Learning Policy Institute, the four key pillars of the community schools approach, which are integrated student supports, expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities, active family and community engagement, and collaborative leadership and practices promote conditions and practices found in high quality schools uh, as well as address out of school barriers to learning. Research shows that community schools, school interventions can result in improvements in a variety of student outcomes including attendance, um, academic achievement, and high school graduation rates. Um, and it can meet the Every Student Succeeds Act standard of evidence-based approaches to support schools and then five for comprehensive and targeted support and intervention. Uh, and lastly, research also shows that these programs offer a strong return on investment of up to fifteen dollars for every dollar invested. Okay. There are a, a number of definitions here. By the time I read the definitions, you have forgotten them. I should use them because they're long. Uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of them, okay? Thank you. Um, so... Because we can read some of this later, we, we yeah. just to get the concept. Yeah. Right? So there are four okay. important um, uh, provisions here, uh, which um, Rep. James mentioned. So a community school means a public elementary or secondary school that includes all four of the following. Integrated student supports, which address out-of-school barriers to le learning through partnerships, with social and health service agencies and providers, uh, coordinated by a community school director, which may include access to services such as medical, dental, vision care, and mental health services, or access to counselors to assist with housing, transportation, nutrition, immigration, or criminal justice issues. Two, expanded and risk learning time and opportunities, including before school, after school, weekend, and summer programs, and provide additional academic construction, individualized academic support, enrichment activities, and learning opportunities that emphasize real-world le learning and community problem solving, and that may include art, music, drama, creative writing, hands-on experience, um, with engineering or science, tutoring and homework help, and recreation, recreational programs that enhance and are consistent with the school's curriculum. Active family and community engagement, which brings student families and the community into the school as partners in the children's education. It makes the school a neighborhood hub, providing adults with a facility to access educational opportunities they want, 
include coordinating services with our separate providers to offer English as a second language classes, uh, green card or citizenship preparation, career skills, art, financial literacy, career counseling, etc. Collaborative leadership and practices which build a culture of professional learning, collective <laughs> trust, and show responsibility using strategies that shall, at minimum, include a school based leadership team, a community school director, and a community wide leadership team, and may include other leadership governments, governments teams. Four areas. Um, I'm going to skip the other definitions except for one, which is eligible school. Uh, Which one? Uh, eligible school, line 13, means a public elementary or secondary school that has a student body where at least 40% of the students are eligible for free or reduced lunch, um, or has been identified for comprehensive or targeted support under federal law. Uh, so schools in need, basically, okay? Um, I'm going to go forward here. Um, and go to the grant authorization. Uh, so we're on line 10. Uh, page. Uh, page 8. eight. Um, this says the agency is authorized to provide planning, implementation, and renewal grants to eligible applicants as follows. A one-year uh, planning grant of up to $20,000 for each eligible school. Um, annual imp implementation grants of $110,000 a year for a period of three years for each eligible school. And at the conclusion of that three-year period, possibly of a renewal grant for up to three years uh, for $110,000 a year. Okay. Um, then there is long language about how you apply for plan grant in D on line 20, which I'm not going to go through. Um, it goes on for a long time. And then E on uh, uh, page 10 goes through the application process for the renewal grants, which I won't go through. Uh, it goes for a long ways. But what's important, I think, is uh, once you get through all that and you get your grant, what do you have to do? Um, so, page 13, line 7, um, is activity for, for um, addition and renewal grants. This is what you have to do uh, in order to um, be a community school. Um, it says, programming services and activities in this subsection shall be tailored to, to school and community needs as identified in an assessment that has to be done earlier in the process. Um, as a condition of receipt of funds, eligible applicants shall, for each eligible school, A, provide a community school director, um, and as applicable, a district level community school initiative director to coordinate services across schools. B, establish or maintain a school-based leadership team uh, and teach or learn communities um, for each, for the SU. Um, uh, I keep community wide leadership team. I know we don't know what these terms mean yet, but we'll come back to them later. Mm -hmm. Implementation of at least two of the following integrated student supports access to health services, access to nutrition services, access to programs that provide assistance to students who have been chronically absent, suspended, or expelled. Um, for example, a long list there. D, implement. Expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities, which may include additional academic instruction, before school, after school, and some learning programs, mentoring, etc. And implementation implement at least two active family and community engagement strategies, which may include on-site early childhood care, education, home visitation services, access to adult education, access to job search preparation access to legal services, access to programs that aid families and communities, um, programs that promote uh, parental involvement, um, and provide other programming or services designed to meet school and community needs, um, and publicly disclose the results. Um, so the, that's the core of this bill, it's what you have to do. So the, the two sections I did go through were all about application processes. This is where the heart of the bill, I think, right here. And then there's a required evaluation by, by AOE, which requires um, um, 
the, um, I won't go through all this, but this, this evaluation by AOE uh, of the program. Um, there is reporting to the General Assembly by AOE uh, for December 15, 2020. Um, and there's appropriation of funds. So there's $2 million appropriated to the Ed Fund, from the Ed Fund to the agency uh, to award these grants. Um, and the effective date is passage. So that's kind of a quick. Yeah, and obviously we're going to need to, to dig into this, and, and, and we will. Um, but I'm going to, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to hear. Can I just ask one question? Sure. Just in uh, terms of Act 60, is this okay with Act 60 if this, if this played out? Yeah, so we talked about that a bit uh, earlier. There's a provision under law that you can't use municipal funds for education, and you can't use education funds for municipal services. This bill consciously has the services not being provided by the school, but being coordinated, coordinated to be brought into the school. So the school, it, these services would not be on the school budget. Uh, they'd be on municipal. Yeah, or they'd be volunteer services or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, basically, what this bill is, is hiring a coordinator, putting together a plan. Uh, to bring in services. So I think that helps that. Thank you. Sorry for the rush. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Thank you no, Jim. It, it, there, there's a lot to it, yeah, and yeah. it did come from another state and trying to turn it into a Vermont. Mm -hmm. The findings and stuff in the quick app. So, thank you. I'll be quick. Yeah, All right. we may get you back. Wait uh, for that bell. <laughs> Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing? Yeah. This is the last week of January. Can you believe it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for the record, Colin Robinson, I'm political director of Vermont EA. I'm going to focus my testimony on the why, um, and specifically why Vermont EA and our 13,000 members think that exploring this pilot that Representative James um, introduced and, and Jim walked through is valuable at this time. And I think. Um, for those of you who served on the committee for some time, you've heard time and time again from our members about the challenges our students are facing. Um, and it's impacting our students at the youngest and earliest grades, and they're coming to, coming to school unprepared to learn because of these complex needs related to poverty, homelessness, mental health, the opioid crisis, and other challenges. Um, and it reflects the research. What we're hearing from our members reflects research out there that we can all intuitively understand that if a child is worried about where they're going to sleep at night or if their caregivers are safe um, or if they're going to be able to have food over the weekend, that's going to impact their ability to actually learn and listen and absorb and engage with their peers and their educators. And that creates barriers to their learning. Um, last April, we surveyed our members on issues that they are seeing in schools. And 93% of them pointed to poverty and hunger um, impacting students and their ability to learn as one of the number one um, factors that they're dealing with. And Chair Webb was part of, in 2017, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Working Group that heard from educators, social workers, doctors, medical professionals across the state um, about the impacts of childhood trauma on, on all citizens, but also specifically in students. And actually, one of your colleagues, I was looking through the, the reflections on the report, and uh, Representative Donahue from Northfield uh, actually had a, had a quote in a digger story where she said, what surprised me the most was hearing testimony from our school system, from teachers, about the really, really dramatic challenges that they're seeing in kids and their ability to, um, at the primary grades, connect to the opioid crisis. And so you've been hearing these from educators, from superintendents, from school board members, from teachers, school counselors. Um, and I hear that bell ringing. Um, We're still good. OK, great. Yeah. Um, and they're heart-wrenching stories, and they happen every single day. The reality is our public schools are already doing a lot of really important things to help support our students in their learning and their families to be successful in our community, because students walk through their doors and they're compassionate educators that tackle those challenges as best they can. Our schools are already providing and doing a lot more than they did 15, let alone 50 years ago. Um, from mental health supports to having washers and dryers inside schools so students who are homeless can have the dignity of wearing clean clothes. 
and um, you know, Representative Conlin, your district, uh, Middlebury High School, I think after several years, just became the 11th school to embed inside the high school um, medical facilities. So students and I believe families, perhaps, I'm sure you can speak to it more, are able to access um, critical healthcare services where they need it in a place that they know well that is safe and accessible. Um, and these are all critical needs that our students and our educators are seeing every single day. And we strongly believe that in order for students to be able to access the learning, the challenges that you're hearing related to literacy, your challenges that you're trying to address with Acts 173, those are parts of the puzzle. We see H104 as another critical piece of the puzzle because teachers and educators in our schools can't be as much as their passion and desire might want them to be. They can't be social workers. They can't be mental health clinicians. They can't be housing advocates. Those, they're professionals whose expertise are housed in that. Um, and they have the acute, uh, the ability to address those systemic challenges for our students and their families. So what I think is really critical, and, and um, Jim and Representative James both spoke to this, is it creates a specific individual inside a school district who's charged with deepening and building out these collaborative relationships with nonprofits, state agencies, to find ways to provide these supports for students and their families in a comprehensive, community-specific way that meets those needs. And it's not asking more of schools, but it's saying, what resources exist in our communities? What resources exist in our state? And how can we make sure that those services are provided to our students and families um, at a time and a place in our schools that can imp have a positive impact on their future success, not only as learners, but also for their lifetime. Um, so I will pause there, um, but really look forward to continuing the conversation on this bill, because I do think that there are opportunities to tailor this for Vermont. And one final point, this is a challenge by choice, right? This is districts saying, you know, this is what's right for us. And we want to step into this opportunity. We want to apply to receive this grant, to tackle these challenges. School's already doing this. It has to be additive. It can't be something you're already doing. Um, if you already have a dental chair in your school, you can't use this grant to um, pay for that already. It has to be about expanding those opportunities to your students and their families. So thank you for your consideration. I apologize for the quickness and brevity, um, but we look forward to continuing the conversation on this. It's a really exciting conversation. Uh, I'm trying to think of what we might be able to do this year. Mm -hmm. yep. We might need to, it might be a step. Absolutely, and I, I think, you know, one thing, we've had, we've had members in this committee for, I think, six or eight years talking about this, this crisis, and, and it really is something that we need to, and I know you all have been, but continue to think creatively about how we address these challenges our students and their families are facing and the impact on students' ability to learn. We don't have the same family profile that we did in the 50s. Definitely not. So, Thank you all. Thanks, Tom. We'll see you again. Representative Sullivan. Okay, thanks for having me in. Thank you. And um, I have a bill today that, um, as you notice, has many co-sponsors. Um, I think it, it's at least tripartisan, if not quadra, if you look at the independents. <laughs> So um, <laughs> let me just tell you how this bill came to be. Um, several of us, uh, you know, probably four or five legislators who are meeting with some UVM faculty members on a totally different um, topic. And uh, one just happened to bring up the fact that it was uh, very annoying that 19, and this is a man, 19 out of 25 of the um, trustees were men. And he's like, we really need to be moving toward gender parity. And Chris Pearson and I started thinking, along with a few of the others, um, you know, we could probably introduce legislation really encouraging that. And um, I'm never critical of people. I think sometimes we just get a little stuck in our ways and um, that we, we you know, want to replace people by, you know, with somebody who looks exactly like ourselves. Uh, so this would be... Um, really good encouragement to get them uh, moving along. And basically, the crux of it is in um, section one, which just um, adds, most of this language is existing language. But could it you, says- Could you scroll it up there? You were looking at- Oh, sorry, sorry. yes. Yeah. Um, here it is. Um, 
The state goal is to have uh, this board achieve um, gender balance by 2025 and maintain it thereafter. Gender balance means that the board is composed of 12 or 13 members who are women or people who identify as women or non-binary. Um, the one one thing that we were really bumping up our fi against our filing deadline, we wanted to include some language about um, diversity mm -hmm. in it that wasn't just gender diversity. Um, we were, I was leaving town, I can't remember where Chris was. We just let the bill go, but um, we do think that that's a bit of a flaw in the bill. Um, but um, we wanted to get it in. So uh, that's pretty much the bill. Questions? Yeah. And this bill is, is directed only at the University of Vermont? It is, and that's, um, somebody else said, well, why don't you include the state colleges? And again, I think it was because we were in the middle of December, we were trying to get this done. Uh, so I suppose that is something mm -hmm. to consider. Do you know what the student and faculty balance is in terms of gender? That, um, I think that there's more, at UVM, I believe there's more women than men for students. That's correct. Yeah. And I'm not sure about the faculty balance. The faculty balance, there's more men than women. Um, and the student balance. You can, get, you, can you give a moment to talk with us about this? Can we put you in the seat or are you just listening? I'm just listening. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, just for the record, can you just say? Sure. I'm yeah. Wendy Koenig, um, Director of Federal and State Relations for UVM. I believe that um, the student ratio is um, it may be 54% women, mm -hmm. somewhere along those lines. Um, and I believe that the faculty ratio is 45% women, approximately. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And I don't think I, if, I'm not sure I, I said it, but uh, 19 out of the 25 um, current members of the board who are men. Who won't like this bill? Who won't like it? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure that all of the trustees like it. <laughs> Some do, because we have two of them who are, at least two, I think maybe only two, who have co-sponsored um, the bill. Yeah. How many of the 25 do we appoint? Is it six? Nine. 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 And does the, um, I assume there's probably an internal mechanism within the board making its own policy that could address this? As I well? assume there probably would be, but I guess they haven't done it, so. Do you know if there's any anything happening within the, the trustee? Well, these are questions we can ask the trustee. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So we would want to hear from the chair of the trustees. We want to hear from the university. Anybody else you can think of would want to hear from? Um, probably um, Professor Paul Bierman, B-I-E-R-M-A-N. I believe it's a professor of geology. Uh, he was extremely supportive. And he also, um, got an online petition going that I believe they have well over a thousand people who have signed on to it so far. To support the yeah. Well, it goes back to the diversity, um, include, including that in terms of either the policy or in this bill. I mean, I, I just would think it would make sense to look at the demographics of Vermont and then right, and that's on, why we were struggling. You couldn't say half, right? Um, right, right. Our demographic, right, and then do a percentage of right. representation. Yeah. I, I think the people that might be concerned about this are, you know, people of color or people. Mm -hmm. that can, and they, you know, um, I think everyone knows um, that we've told them that we just were bumping yeah. up the deadline and we let it go, and yeah. we're hoping the committee might come up with some language that works. Yeah. Can you scroll down a little bit, too? Sure. So basically, um, all, there is a little bit of, that's just um, correction. Uh, so it just says, in order to achieve the balance, um, trustees shall be appointed under, you know, that each year they have to be working toward it and then let us know. Um, how far they've gone so that when we appoint our trustees and the governor appoints his trustees that we be aware of this and really try to move it forward. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, 
done. Yeah, I do think, you know, the state colleges, if if we are going to look at a proposal like this, um, having testimony from them would make sense. I mean, I'm a member of the board. I don't want to speak for the board, but representation is always important. Do you know what your balance is on the state colleges? Can't think of it off the top of my head. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting topic, that's for sure. Complex one. Can of worms. <laughs> in terms of other uh, other areas to, to consider besides gender, mm -hmm. what the role of the board is, something of interest. Okay, so I would say if we were to move forward, that we would want to hear from the um, chair of the trustees. Uh, we want to hear from you, ma'am. We want to hear from. Professor Fearman. Um, and actually, I think that um, there's a women's caucus. I think it's called a women's caucus, faculty caucus. Um, and I'm forgetting the name of the chair of that. Um, but I could find it for you. And the state colleges. Can we get a copy of the current policy? I mean, there must be a policy for how the selection is made. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I just, looking at the law, yeah. these commissions and boards are usually set up uh, to be, you know, to designate who appoints what. So it is an interesting question of how you achieve the balance. For instance, not uncommon in boards and commissions to talk about party balance in the mm -hmm. case of folks that are being appointed by political officials. And so it, it would be good to know. I mean, I think UVM could give us an analysis of and probably point out if there are concerns with the current appointment process that's contemplated, but we might also have Jim do a little research on that. It might be helpful. Our Jim. Mm -hmm. Our Jim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe something that would take more than more to do. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Thank you. Take care. Is that your cup here? Very good. That's why I put my name on it. <laughs> 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 Aren't you people having lunch? <laughs> okay. Just one before we go, I just wanted we had the public hearing tonight, and if you haven't done a public hearing before, I've never run one before, so we'll see how that goes. But this is not a time we do not ask questions. All they do is present. She looked at me directly. <laughs> <laughs> you have to sit on your hands. That's all there is to it. She's interrogated. Take notes. Yeah. <laughs> Take notes. Um, that it's not a time to ask questions. This is a time for people to have three minutes to speak. Um, and I know that the decoded dyslexia folks have put out a notice, so I'm pretty sure we're going to have that pretty well represented on that. Right now, I'm breaking the, li the list into two groups, um, not pro-con, but uh, personal experience and professional. So we make sure that we'll get, we'll get you know, yeah, both. Idea. Thank you. Um, 4.30 to 6.30. 4.30 to 6.30. 6 o'clock. We'll see what happens. Um, Kathleen, you will be, as the clerk, you will be running the clock. Okay. And the clock, we will have, you will be telling people who's up and who's on deck. Okay. Okay. So we should have an on deck chair. Um, and we'll, we'll be balancing back and forth. Okay, okay. So right between the private and the professional. Yes, whatever right. So whatever we can, I don't, I don't know how it will be. Um, I, I want to make sure that we get through the, as many of the folks as we can. And if we have to extend, and we'll extend. Okay. Room eleven. Room eleven. Yeah. And maybe we won't. Maybe we'll be done. Mm -hmm. um, we we do have a dinner. We do have a dinner. Yeah, we do. Today. We're going to try that. Yeah. Right. Where where is it? Mm -hmm. Right Boston. across the street. Oh, Capital okay. Plaza. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 That's Ken C. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, thank you all. I'm struggling to get the agency in to provide testimony for us on a variety of things, so I'm a little stuck on us moving. I am mm. feeling some pressure. 
some time pressure going on here. Uh, it's likely that with the um, pre-K bill, that it's going to need to go to human services. We're looking at it. We'll probably also go to appropriations. There's a good chance that we'll put money in it. And all this has to be done by the end of February. So <laughs> that, that's, that's where we are. Um, and, and the same literacy will probably, probably just go to appropriations. Um, Sarita is going to um, keep in touch with our friends up in Human Services on the, uh, the um, uh, birth control bill. Um, so we just just have them, you know, to help you with keeping track of that. Okay. Yep. Um, and that's okay. So you'll be able to go up and. Yep. and now, can posted. I miss some of? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. I can. Yeah. 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 Um, and we, we we won't have to vote in any votes or anything like that. Without okay. <laughs> but okay. Um, how are people doing with what's going on with literacy and and okay? Are we going to get uh, the costs of things? You know the uh, the <laughs> cost of what? Of the cost of any implementations or initiatives that we're thinking. Are we? Yeah. What is, is it? Yeah. I'm blanking on J J J F O. J F O. Will we, will we be getting kind of? If we're going to put money into it, yes, they will be going through through the money. It depends what we're going to do. And we'll see that. Yeah, we'll see that. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 So I, I, we probably will need some committee time soon to yeah. sort of make sure that everybody can put their arms around both of those bills. Yes. I'm personally having a little bit of yeah. trouble. I, I um, so hear you. Mm -hmm. um, that would be great. And yeah. I think I think one of the challenges with literacy, which we're going to see tonight, we've seen in the chair already, is that, um, wow, opposite sides, yeah. strongly feeling. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Very and opinionated. I, I, and I don't know what I'm doing. So are those? <laughs> I think that we can. I think that there's a way that we can step ourselves back from that. I think that there's a way that we can step from a little bit higher picture and mm -hmm. not get into that that level of detail while just making sure that that our teachers are getting the coaching that they need. That, I heard from so, yeah. from our assistant superintendent yeah. the weekend. I met with her for about an hour. Oh, good. She has a lot of concerns and yeah. Um, so I told yeah. her to submit a letter if she could. Yep. You've definitely gotten a few. I don't know if it's just gone to me, if it's gone to you. I'll, I'll post the ones. I'll send the ones I'm getting yeah. to you as well. I'm we getting a lot of emails. Yeah, and I think that there's part of this me that too. we're going to want to back away from a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been having uh, uh, there's a hard time orienting myself on the literacy uh, conversation. The pre-K feels a little more um, easier to wrap my head around, uh, and the literacy just feels like a kind of siloed conversation that should be happening under an umbrella of 173, as I've mentioned before. Yeah. And it also feels just like a really hot topic that we're way down in the weeds of, but we're not having it. We're almost like not having the conversation in context. And so yeah. it's, it's kind of short-circuiting my brain a little bit, honestly. <laughs> I think it was necessary to get into the weeds to get a little bit of an idea about what, what some of those things are. I don't think you can walk into this without knowing some of, some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that we, we don't have to spend our time dictating that level of detail. I think we can say, we've got reading scores that are not good. We have a report from DMG that says this is an area. Here are some things you should do. We can look at that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm starting to get, I, I will, I'm going to try to speak offline with um, Meg and Roy at some point just to pick her brain a little bit and we'll bring her back in. Um, but just to, to try to organize that, I've, I've asked Jim to start putting together findings findings from the DMG report that will start the basis of our next bill. So it's my, my expectation that the three bills that we have are going over here. And we're starting with a committee bill that will have findings about where we're going. Good. And then we'll, I've got some ideas and we'll hear some ideas, ideas as well. Okay. But yeah. I wanted to add from my district, 
<coughs> what I heard was a lot of agreement with um, Megan Roy's testimony mm -hmm. and um, the sort of um, belief that this work is already well underway or be just beginning with Act 173 mm -hmm. and that, a bill that any bill that we might pass would divert from, compete with, distract from, or God forbid even ignite some sort of conflict. Right. You know, conflicting, not conflict, <laughs> conflicting. Yeah, conflict. Um, yeah, conflict, for real. conflict is, yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm just passing along the yeah. message that I'm getting from home. Yeah. Well, and I think that, that there are some, some districts that are further along than others. Mm -hmm. um, and bear in mind, we don't have good scores. <laughs> that's part of, that's yeah. a piece of data that we need to be addressing. We can't ignore it. Yeah. Can we just look at the scores? I mean, I was wondering, without maybe naming districts, although I could get the you know, if we could just see in here, <laughs> was that yeah. the topic? But I'm across Vermont, like just topic. to get a sensing of like they don't want what the score ranges, you know, and yeah. who might be doing really well, and who you know who might not even to look at specific districts, just yeah. to say this district, whatever district it is in Vermont is really struggling and this district seems to be it's doing really well. It's a question I've got from the agency. We okay. ended up getting Wendy Giller that kind of went on a tangent that wasn't the tangent that I was hoping we were going to be going on. Mm -hmm. I want to get back on to how are, how are our kids doing. Yep. Fourth and eighth, I think. Fourth and eighth. Right. So yeah. Not as good as her. Was Friday's testimony basically the reading wars taking there? Uh, was that a back and forth? In, there in was terms of there was a little bit of that, I would say, but also heard that the um, decoding dyslexia people are also they appear that they don't need as much defining as long as the programs are happening in the school. Right. It felt like the room was divided, literally yeah. that side agreed, um, yeah. and that was the science-based side, and this is the, the balanced literacy side? No, you know? I would not agree that it was it was that. I think what, what we're seeing is, if we go back to our, our, you know, Scarborough rope over there, the bottom part of that says it is necessary to have this for to teach the structure of learning, how our oral language relates to all those little figures on the print. It says, and most people are not born with that knowledge. There are specific st teaching strategies to get there. Um, and, and many teachers feel unprepared for that. And, and I know it because I've seen it. Sure. Okay? It's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. But I am, it's not sufficient, and that's what Megan was saying. Am I correct in understanding there are two camps? The, Balanced you know, literacy versus. They, they, what I would say is that there are they have different camps that have different emphasis. Oh, yeah. So I think if we can recognize that both have value and are both necessary, and together you're sufficient. But you can't do it without one. You can't do it without the other. They have to combine. They have to have both. And so I think um, where where the, the people with with you know identified um, learning disabilities related to reading, they must have the direct instruction down there. A lot of kids can kind of pick up some of those pieces. They just, I had one daughter that did. She's got it. She broke the code. But we did, we did a lot in breaking the code. She had a lot, well, she, had, she had a lot of conversation about, about this, those and those things. But um, there are kids that they will fail without that direct instruction. And so what we're looking at, I think what they were what they were talking about in the programs that are going on in Hinesburg and Charlotte, that the Dakota dyslexia folks were saying that would work for me, mm -hmm. okay? And there, but these people are saying just remember that that's a component, that's not our whole program. Right. So I think if we can bear in mind, it's not either or, it's both and, and that we can sort of rise to say. I, I guess an analogy that I'm thinking about in this is, is the idea of the ramp. Do we need to do you need do we need to have a diagnosis to say why you should be using the ramp? Or do we just build the ramp? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I think that we can get to, you know, the foundations of, of reading and the, the delight of, of what it brings to us in terms of expanding knowledge and learning. Um, without having to define, is, is it possible? 
but we need to make sure that these folks know that um, teachers are getting the instruction that they need. There are very specific strategies you learn to break down why why the letters work that way. How you attack a multisyllabic word. It's got chunks in it. And there are rules to all of those that you can break down the word yesterday in three syllables. You can break it down if you know the structure. So I think they felt heard when I talked to them. Yeah. They, the, they felt like we really heard them. So and yeah. they really appreciated that. And we that. need to hear them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.